There's no way to build a top-down proletarian state. That's that's uh, impossible. It's a contradiction in terms, essentially. Yeah. Which and then like say like then it's depending on your definition of state, like it's not a state anymore because <laughs> it's the people controlling themselves. Yes, and that's why anarchists, of course, wouldn't call that a state, <laughs> right? <laughs> They'd say that's not really a state. At that point, it has nothing in common with the historical features of the state, you know? Like yeah. what the state actually is, once again, the anarchists are describing the state mechanically as what it right. is, not, not the kind of imposing these ideological features onto it. All right. Hi, and welcome to the Skeptical Leftist Podcast, the show where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm speaking with Daniel, aka Anarch. Thanks for joining me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Good to see you. So uh, I guess uh, hopefully everybody who watches my channel already knows your channel. Uh, but if they don't, go over and watch the Anarch YouTube. Uh, lots of good informational videos over there about anarchy and anarchism and stuff. But uh, one of the things I wanted to, I kind of just watched a couple of your videos yesterday, like you had a five minute video on why Marxist Leninists have a, their uh, conception of the state is kind of non nonsense, but really. And I, uh, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Like, what is wrong with the uh, Marxist Leninist version of the state? Well, it should be said that I think the uh, Marxist conception of the state really just has problems to begin with. <clears throat> um, you know, in the video, I didn't really lay out what uh, Marx's and Engels' conceptions of the state actually are. The video you're talking about was kind of me addressing uh, common talking points that people often present, which uh, may or may not actually resemble the position of Marx and Engels. I mean, I'll start by saying, you know, Marx and Engels' conception of the state is that the state is that body w by which some class suppresses another class, right? So it's it's right. made just a, a tool of class dictatorship. And with that conception, you know, you might imagine that any just organized militant body which suppresses reaction uh, in whatever way that that exists is a state. You know, right. so if uh, even if the proletariat organized together into uh, federations of militias to suppress, uh, you know, reaction, uh, the, the uh, attempted re-arising of the bourgeois, that would also still classify as a state under this Marxist conception. My problem is, I think this is way, way too broad of an understanding of what the state is. Yeah. Uh, I just think that it's kind of an incoherent understanding of the state because every society has some militant capacity that is used in order to suppress people who are trying to harm society, right? Uh, now, we could get into fiddly details here about just uh, are average people doing terrible things, the arising of a new class? I would say not necessarily, but there is this issue at hand that – what they do is they essentially point to any structure whatsoever that is acting to suppress the previous ruling class, whether that's like a monarchic class or the previous bourgeois in one way or another. And they just say that this is a proletarian state, even though the proletarian really aren't in power in this state. So what you get is a definition that is just too wishy-washy to really be able to analyze what the state is historically. Um, I think that it's a very ideological conception of the state. It should be said that the state historically does act to empower one class over another, but that is not its uh, sheer dis uh, description. That is not its mechanical description, what defines a state. Right. Right. So I think where anarchists uh, uh, differ here is basically that they say, no, the state is a particular organizational structure. It has a particular uh, nature to it by way of how it is structured. 
And yeah. they come to this definition by looking at the historical reality of what the state actually is, right? They're not, they're not kind of like uh, trying to impose a sort of class-oriented ideology onto the state. They're saying the state, by its historical reality, is essentially a body which uh, monopolizes power in society. And by this, uh, by this function, it alienates the masses of people from control over the civil functions of society. You know, those, those institutions such as uh, justice, the institutions such as decision making over the rules and regulations of society, you know, uh, and this is to say the courts, uh, uh, the legislative bodies, the, the police, you know, all of these things. Uh, and often it's included like the banks in certain situations. Right. Um, these are all capacities of the state. Uh, these are the functions that the state alienates the masses from control over, right? So it's a monopolistic entity. Uh, it's, it's hierarchical and centralized by its very nature. So I get into arguments then with Marxist-Leninists who claim that something like the USSR or Maoist China uh, is a proletarian state. However, the problem is that the proletarian didn't really rule in these states. Instead, the people who had power in the, the states that we're noting here are generally just a small group of people in administrative apparatus. So they just do all of these things that we've just discussed, right? They, they manage legislation, uh, you know, they, they control the police and the military. They still alienate the people, the masses, from control right. over society. So the anarchist points out, this really isn't empowering the proletarian. So in, it's, it's in no way, you might say, a proletarian state. Yeah. So I guess after yeah. all of this, it kind of circles us back around to if what you think a state is, if, if your conception of the state is like so vague and broad as to say that, you know, any body of militant uh, control, which, uh, you know, just suppresses some reactionary class as a state, then the only people who have ever actually made a proletarian state in this sense are anarchists and libertarian socialists. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah, like you say, like even like the USSR, which was uh, sort of supposedly a, a proletarian revolution, became a, its own type of bourgeois state or elitist state. Yeah. Rather you know, than you know, like... I I think there's I think there's good reason to say that it actually was just a bourgeois state, uh, <laughs> given that they actually did continue colluding with a lot of the previous business class in the USSR right. from beforehand. In fact, they uh, employed a lot of them into administrative positions where they still uh, basically continued as uh, the managers of those means production that they had prov previously been ruling over, just instead of them having private ownership, they had uh, uh, the managerial control through state ownership. So right. the actual workplaces changed, changed their character almost not at all in these situations. And it should be said that that isn't, even that wasn't always the arrangement. There was still some considerable existence of private industry in the USSR to the degree where they actually just still had a ton of those people who previously owned the businesses continuing to own private workplaces within yeah. the USSR's economy. So what you really have is still a bourgeois state. Uh, yeah. And the anarchists point out that this is just because if you create this sort of hierarchical power structure, it is going to enforce the will of this of hierarchical power structures more generally within society and in the economic sphere. That's capitalism. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, regardless of whether or not the intentions of the people doing, you know, are well good or whatnot, because the means they have are state means or hierarchical means, right? So they can't achieve actual uh proletarian like equal fucking society yeah the argument of libertarian socialists and anarchists has always been if you want the people to be empowered you have to directly empower them right yeah. it, the the people cannot be empowered indirectly you know the anarchist and libertarian socialists more generally kind of object to this concept of uh representation by any given entity right it, yeah. there's no party there's no vanguard there's no state that can quote unquote represent a mass of people this is sort of um a liberal mythology which justifies the structure of the republic 
the anarchists and libertarian socialists more generally say that they have to be empowered by having actual decision making power that they have to actually ha be able to make decisions and then their decisions are implemented that is power so if you want a proletarian state it has to be bottom up there's no way to build a top down proletarian state that's that's uh, impossible it's a contradiction in terms essentially yeah which and then like say like then it's depending on your definition of state like it's not a state anymore because <laughs> it's the people controlling themselves yes and that's why anarchists of course wouldn't call that a state <laughs> right <laughs> they say that's not really a state at that point it has nothing in common with the historical features of the state you know like yeah. what the state actually is once again the anarchists are describing the state mechanically as what it right. is not not the kind of imposing these ideological features onto it yeah rather than like like you say like a philosophical like concept of the state we're looking at what was it what did it do and how do you describe it in reality yes yes so this is why often anarchists who really have like thought this through and have been through these sort of debates a lot uh often point out the anarchists have the materialist analysis of the state right they recognize <laughs> the state actually is in the real world um not through like uh, our ideas about what states are but just mechanically what they are and in that capacity that's why anarchists are anti-state they're looking at those mechanical features and they're saying those mechanical features cannot be present in a revolution and if they are it is the death of the revolution so yeah. here's really the issue then okay and so in that video what i'm actually responding to is not even necessarily like that sort of marxist conception of the state but there are a lot of authoritarian leftists who then use a more liberal definition of the state which is just that it's like any body of administration that manages the civil affairs of society right and then <laughs> my issue with this is it basically means that you can't have statelessness. It's like, okay, well, so what you're saying is every f way that humans organize themselves is somehow now a state. Right. Well, that's nonsensical, right? Like, okay, so you're saying that societies we all would regularly just call stateless, now because they had coordination and some form of organization administration, that means they're now states. They had states, yeah. which I consider it to be another demonstration of the sort of incoherence of this way of looking at it. This is why I hold the anarchist definition of the state. It's the only one that doesn't have these sort of inherent incoherences, that doesn't have these internal contradictions. It points to the features. It says, those are the features. We don't want them moving on, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Therefore, we're against states. That's it. Yeah. Right. It's it's just not that complicated when you when you understand what the state actually is, not what we want it to conceptually be or some state we could imagine might exist in a different world that we don't have. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 It makes me think of like uh, just on Twitter the other day, there was like uh, some I guess they they're call they call themselves communists. I don't know exactly what their ideology is, but they're accusing like they're talking about small businesses being petty bourgeois, and uh, and there's people who are uh, disabled who are selling their uh, Etsy products, and they're like, well, but I'm not petty bourgeois. I'm just uh, I'm just a person, a disabled person doing what it takes to get by, and so then you've got this ideological version of what the petty bourgeois is. Uh, like a small business owner who owns a, a, so a building, owns property, has employees conflicting with the reality of people who are working and trying to make ends meet within the, the only means they have available to them. Yeah, yeah. There's. I think that the Marxist class analysis starts from a place that seems really solid, which is it says you are in a particular class by your relation to the means of production. Right. Right. And that that's like a good starting place. It kind of makes sense, um, especially when all you're thinking about is the is just this sort of simple bifurcation where you've got the proletariat and the bourgeois. And it's like, right. okay, yeah, we can pretty clearly see this dividing line, right? Like there are those who only make money through the recirculation of their capital and their ownership of the means of production. And there are those who exchange their labor for a wage and don't have ownership of the means of production, right? Like this seems like a pretty easy two categories to work out. Right. But then you start to get these weird fiddly like things at the boundaries. 
And this was supposed to be kind of cleared up with these, the, the addition of these uh, of the lumpen proletariat and right. the petite bourgeois, right? The yeah. lumpen proletariat just basically being the criminal underclass more broadly, the unemployed yeah. or the you know those those who can't be employed, who can't exchange their their labor for a wage, and the petite bourgeois being those who own a business but are typically still involved in it and don't only make money through the recirculation of their capital. They do own the means of production that they have very presently, but they don't have large enough ownership to have now uh, uh, made money purely through the recirculation of capital. But what we see here is that these boundaries are actually quite a bit more fuzzy than they immediately appear when you first kind of hear the description, right? And I think uh, uh, Part of the issue was Marx thought that as the means of production were socialized, which is to say that the means of production were owned by more and more people, this was going to lead to the breakdown of capitalism. However, instead what we see is that now some of some people are actually able to just kind of uh, make ends meet uh, uh, really m more like at the scale of a wage laborer owning kind of small scale means of production, you know, for yeah. example, like us as uh, streamers or YouTubers, right? You know, I right. own my computer, I own the camera and so on. You know, these are the means of production of the content that goes on this website, right? Or the yeah. websites that we upload to. However, I do not just make money off of the recirculation of capital. I'm pretty poor. I'm like literally below the poverty line, okay? Like I'm clearly not doing super well and I have no employees. I couldn't afford to pay an employee if I wanted to. Right. I'm barely getting by in my own life. Um, so what we see is the socialization of the means of production is taking place and yet capitalism continues. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was sort of this presumption that, you know, that there, these would take place in step. As the socialization of the means of production took place, capitalism would begin to dissolve for a variety of reasons. We're just seeing that that analysis kind of broke down. And the people who are in this category of what might be called petite bourgeois are now expanding. And instead of it including people who are more and more like the bourgeois, it's now beginning to include more and more people who are like the proletariat, which are people that are really just making, making ends meet through kind of a wage labor relation, something that's on the scale of a wage labor relation. This right. really confuses the categories at that at that boundary, I think. Yeah, and I think like uh you see that discussion with sex workers a lot too, is like because they would have been part of the lump and proletariat at one point, but then in a, a modern economy uh where you can sell it uh, your your uh, you can sell sex in a variety of ways, then they get labeled as pe uh petty bourgeois. Or they get labeled, you know, or a combination somehow of both, right? So they're lump and proletariat and they're petty bourgeois. And you go, well, then how does this make any sense? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, the truth is, is that the categories, if they have any use, they can only be understood as broad groupings of people that might have similar interests, right? And I think that that's probably the most faithful way to understand what Marx was really getting at was that a mm. class is people who have similar interests by way of their relation to the means of production. And I think in his time, the lines made a lot more sense and it was a lot easier to just point to examples and be like, see, this example follows these trends and that example right. follows these trends. And people within that category have these tendencies for beliefs and, and uh, particular kinds of class consciousness. But now that the boundaries are all so much more blurred, I think that we're really seeing how the, these class categories are um, not completely robust, that they are kind yeah. of breaking down. Now, I think, I think the, the truth is, is that uh, the bourgeois remains a pretty good class category overall, right? Yeah. If, you, if you own the means of production and you only make money through the recirculation of your capital or you make money through the recirculation of your capital, yeah you probably have extremely different class interests than the rest of us, right? Yeah, that's right. But um, the petite bourgeois as a category is a lot, uh, a lot, you know, more complicated. It's a lot more difficult to parse out. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, we see that in these sorts of examples. I see sometimes too, like uh, discussions of like, like I have one, one guy I, who I quite like, but he's, he thinks that like pretty much every worker in the West should be considered uh, petite bourgeois, or or we should abandon the Marxist classes altogether, and like only the uh, like uh, because we outsourced all our labor to uh, 
poorer countries in the, in the global south. So then you go, well, okay, but why can't we, like, I feel like, why can't we broaden the term proletariat to be like, this is all of us. And we aren't like, we're all the people who aren't the bourgeois, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that the reason, the motivation for the petite bourgeois being considered as a separate class themselves, it was really meant to describe the sort of middle class and the upper middle class who had begun to engage in business practices. And mm -hmm. what they had noticed after quite a few decades of experience with radical struggle was that these people were the most likely people to side with, you know, reaction and fascist right. insurgencies. And they were the they were the key demographic for fascist fascist Which insurgencies. Which I suppose we still see, right? Like, yeah, no, really, it's still the case. That's one of the reasons why I understand that people keep using this classification is that, yeah, absolutely, you know, like your fascist insurgents is is, is like your your used car salesman and your, you know, small yeah. business owners, you know, the people who are right on that border of maybe making it. And so they imagine that one day they may have power within the system. And so they have like a strong impetus to defend the system because they believe they might still continue to move up within it. Uh, that being said, you know, we're just seeing that all of these categories are getting really uh, d d you know, defrayed, diffused, uh, uh, confused, as you say. And, you know, part of the reason why there's also uh, confusions and difficulties in the category we would call proletariat because part of why, how they defined the proletariat was these are people who do quote unquote productive labor, productive right. labor being you make things, okay? Things, things come out of your labor, you know? Right. Um, so then you get Starbucks employees aren't proletariat because they don't produce anything. Precisely, precisely. The question yeah. then becomes, you know, in my, in my mind, the question would then become, well, what becomes of the proletariat when they automate the vast majority of the economy, right? The proletariat is no longer the masses. Then we're yeah. just going to have a vast economy of, uh, of middlemen. So I was just talking with a friend of mine earlier about this, that you know, the United States is essentially a middleman economy. Right. We've mm -hmm. outsourced almost all of the means of production, as you just said. And even people who are lowly wage laborers are still just middlemen of a sort. You know, like I work at, if I worked at Best Buy or I, when I worked at Best Buy, uh, you know, I didn't produce anything. I wasn't on a right. factory line making the cameras or whatever. You know, I was a middleman. I was a sales salesperson on the floor. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, by that old categorization of the proletarian, that that's not a pro, that's not the proletariat, right? right? However, retail workers make up an enormous sector of the economy in almost every economy now. So these categories don't work very well, in my opinion. I think that I think they're good overviews to start right. to understand the ideas, but I think the anarchist power analysis is more robust, which is to say. It doesn't look at, it doesn't try to only think about classes. It takes classes into consideration, understands that there are indeed class struggles, but it right. understands the classes as being defined by their ability to control the world, right? The ability mm. to enact their will in the world. You know, when I make a decision, what is the possibility that it's actually actualized? And if, right. my, if I, uh, you know, contribute my labor to society, but I have low decision-making power, I'm on the bottom. And if yeah. I do very little labor, yet I have very large decision-making power, I'm on the top, right? And yeah. my, my relation to these facts, how that is or is not distributed, determines my actual class orientation. And I think that's the really robust way to understand what's happening here. You know, oh, why is a Best Buy worker, even though they don't do any productive labor, um, you know, part of this uh, proletarian class, if that's how we want to define it, it's fine. Uh, because they have literally like no power and they sell their, their labor in exchange for a wage. You know, this, yeah. this aspect of productive labor is increasingly meaningless as automation increases. So I don't know. There's just lots of problems just as such. Yeah. And like, <laughs> at, like you say, as you get like into more like the business type of uh, business class or what have you, like people who are, you know, they, they interact with, politicians on a more one-on-one -on -one level and they have similar income levels then, and they're trading less of their labor. They may work in an office still, but they trade less of their labor for uh, wage. Then yeah, then they are in a different class in the power st structure than the Best Buy worker. 
Yeah, exactly. And what it really comes down to is the anarchist conception just says we're trying to empower the masses. To empower yeah. the masses, that means we have to disempower people who have enormous leverage um, and put very, very little in. What we need to do is we need to create distributed power structures so that we don't have these people who are making you know vast fortunes for just being middlemen who literally just sit around and profit off of the recirculation of their capital. Um, because the truth is, is that you know at the at the end of the day, uh, the people who own the means of production are mostly like just shareholders, right? You know that's yeah. that's the people who really own it. A lot of the time, it's not even the CEO. But the CEO is definitely a class enemy, right? Like the CEO right. is almost always the bad guy. They're almost always fighting against you. Yet, usually the CEO doesn't have majority ownership and they do contribute administrative labor sometimes, right? Sure. So what we're really looking at is a sort of gradation rather than the strict boundaries by which we can see right. what's really going on. The CEO is clearly not an ally, but they're not an ally – not really necessarily purely by the way of their relation to the means of production, even though that's obviously important, but instead that they just have outsized power to make decisions, uh, which everybody is involved in. So the anarchist just says, cool, well, let's just make power structures where everybody is involved in the decision-making process instead. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I don't know. I was going to, I kind of shift gears a little bit to uh, asking you, about some of the activism you've been doing and uh, some of the work you've been doing in your community and, and whatnot, because <laughs> I got a comment on one of my shorts about how all I see is a bunch of flapping gums and you guys don't do a goddamn thing. So <laughs> I, I find that anarchists are often the ones that are doing things. So I guess in, in your case, what are some things that you're involved in? Yeah, I mean, I guess insofar as that's that's the answer you're looking for, I'll just start by saying, you know, I've been organizing since like 2011, right? Basically since right. Occupy Wall Street. So I've been doing this for like 13 years now. Uh, I started in Occupy uh, Tulsa. And in Occupy Tulsa, we mostly organized protests, did, you know, civil disobedience. But the most important thing that I got from, uh, from uh, Occupy Tulsa was uh, learning how to facilitate general assemblies, uh, learning how, seeing how decision-making processes solve problems, uh, you know, essentially learning how consensus functions in order to come to decisions and so on, uh, learning its uh, strengths and pitfalls. And, you know, I don't need to belabor the ways that Occupy Wall Street as a movement was both effective and ineffective. Uh, right. But I, I learned a lot from it in that sense. After that, I actually was involved uh, in a campaign to uh, legalize medical marijuana here in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, I was one of the main organizers, canvassing organizers for that. I, I organized um, the entire like OKC region of the of uh, of Oklahoma. And uh, there was only, you know, one other major branch of that, and that was like the Tulsa area. So it was one of the two major canvassing organizers for legalizing medical marijuana in the state. Um, then around the time of the George Floyd protest, I, I had a little stint in the DSA, but I don't think the DSA w ended up really ultimately doing anything very effective here in, uh, in Tulsa. So almost really not worth noting. Uh, then, then the next big things I got involved in uh, were during the George Floyd protests, which is now only about you know three years ago. Was that twenty twenty? Yeah, yeah. 2020. But we're at the beginning of twenty twenty four, so that's still about three years ago. Yeah. Which uh, uh, me and uh, another person named Roberto Mendoza, we started Cooperation Tulsa. So Cooperation Tulsa is um, a group that is part of the Symbiosis Network. Uh, which also includes groups like Cooperation Jackson, which people are probably more familiar with. They've probably heard about Cooperation Jackson before. Cooperation Tulsa is still functioning. Cooperation Tulsa, I would say, is the most effective group I've ever been part of uh, and actually does have uh, – uh, it's building dual power in a way that I've never seen before. I think I'm, awesome. I'm very, very committed to it for that reason. So Cooperation Tulsa, during the George Floyd protests, we got our start by helping to build uh, uh, democratically controlled uh, community gardens at historically black churches. So we essentially went to the black churches. We said, hey, 
um, you know, we'd like to help you build a community garden. And the first one we went to was a church called Vernon AME. And we got, uh, uh, we fundraised for that. We used uh, crowdfunding. We got a few thousand dollars together and we built a community garden out back of Vernon AME Church. Then uh, awesome. after people heard about what we were doing there, they uh, essentially one person, Mary Odom is her name. She donated us uh, 2.5 acres of land, which we are now cultivating. Uh, wow. and we then went on to build another community garden at another church called uh, church of the restoration, which is another black church in the Greenwood district. In fact, it's literally on Greenwood street. <laughs> okay. uh, and that one actually had a democratic council structure over top of it as well. So everybody within the church came together and made decisions democratically th through a direct democracy. And people in the neighborhood could also show up to those meetings and make decisions along with them about what kind of things would be planted, how it would be expanded, et cetera. So, Sounds like they were on the right track before. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, they, they were actually. It was like we were um, very pleased to find out that when we started talking with people at Church of the Restoration, they were super on board right off the bat. It took literally no <laughs> convincing. They were like, oh, yeah, definitely. We're down with this. We like this idea. Nice. Right. Um, That's awesome. So then uh, uh, ultimately, then we started a community center. Uh, we opened a community center in Tulsa and uh we began uh fundraising to keep the community center open because you know it takes money to keep a community yep. center open we had to pay rent and utilities and all of that and unfortunately we were not able to get the recurring income to keep the community center open ultimately but that recurring income now goes towards the development of flat rock which is what we call that 2.5 acres of land that we have um, okay. just outside of turley which is at the northern boundary of tulsa so yeah, like we're working on that as well, but those are just the big notes. We're also doing popular education programs, which is to say we have reading groups. We have both a, both a, a beginner's reading group and an advanced reading group, which meet like, uh, both of them meet twice a month. Uh, you know, we're doing all those kinds of things. We've done lots of, uh, engagement and interaction with other organizations. Uh, we've come together with a, a group called scissor tail anarchist organization, which I'm also part of scissor tail anarchist organization. So now we've built a federation of organizations within Tulsa, uh, including those two groups currently, but we're also now looking to expand, to include more groups within the federation. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So lots of, lots of stuff, you know, like there's, there's a bunch <laughs> of stuff that I left out as well, just, you know, course, just, uh, yeah. saving for time, but no, you know, I've been doing this for, for eh, over a decade now. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think when we first spoke, I hadn't, I didn't, I was an anarchist in Regina and I didn't know any other anarchists. And since then, like I've discovered that like there's like a, a food, food distribution group that is uh, anarchist led. There's there's uh, like a variety of there's up in uh, Saskatoon. There's food, not bombs. There's like there's lots of people who are, are doing like they do uh, like tours. Like they I guess they walk downtown after a sir after dark and give out water bottles and they have naloxone kits in case uh, people need that. And they do CPR if some people need that. There's like, like they literally are out there doing the work that society is leaving undone. And then I see people having, you know, on, on my comments talking about how anarchists are just flapping gums and not doing anything. And I'm going like, except I know people who are doing like traumatizing help work <laughs> because it needs to be done and they're doing it for free or out of their own pocket. Like, it's not like, they're doing nothing. So, yeah, I find that I've always found that to be the weirdest criticism because everywhere I look, it's like only anarchists and libertarian socialists doing anything. <laughs> like I like, you know, I look, I look at places where authoritarian leftists are organizing and it seems like all they are is groups. They, they they've got a party, but they don't, they don't do anything. They just attend protests. That's it. Um, yeah. ooh, they got lots of people in the party and they, literally do nothing and build no power 
and are barely involved in any sort of direct action that actually changes anything. They're not building any dual power. Most of the time, they're not even involved in unionization movements, which is ostensibly what they're supposed to be doing. And they're also ostensibly supposed to be doing like, you know, uh, uh, parliamentary, you know, parliamentarianism, like entering the electoral system, but they can't get elected either. So it's right. really, it seems like, uh, you know, throwing throwing stones in glass houses kind of thing on that one. <laughs> yeah, not not a very co uh, complete or uh, comprehensive argument against anarchists. Yeah, it demonstrates that they just, because they don't see it, they think it's not being done, right? Like, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. In, in every city, yeah. anarchists are the ones doing harm reduction. They're the ones doing mutual aid. In our city, I haven't even mentioned that, you know, there's also groups like SHOTS, which are doing harm reduction. Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, Food Not Bombs, which is doing, you know, mutual aid and uh, fe feeding the homeless and and so on. You know, those things are all being done majority by anarchists and libertarian socialists of various kinds. Yeah, it's all it's all like you say, it's it's the stuff you don't see. It's the hidden work that because it's dealing with the people who need it the most often. Mm -hmm. So so then they're the the people that don't make it on TV unless there's an uprising or, or a, a problem. Right. Like, I think there was lots of anarchists involved with the uh, the homeless encampments here in our city and and helping the people that live there. And then but you don't hear about the homeless encampments unless there's an overdose. And people use that as a justification for the police to go in and break down the encampment because there, there was drugs there or whatever. And you go, well, there's lots of work being done. And it's always like the, the invisible work that doesn't get accounted for. Absolutely. Yeah, because, you know, at the end of the day, anarchists are really trying to help those that are on the bottom. You know, that's part of the ethos of anarchism. We're trying to empower the masses. And we take that seriously. You know, yeah. like we're not just trying to organize the quote unquote proletarian, you know, the lump and proletariat, as they're called, are also <laughs> important. And yeah. they need to be, you know, understood as human beings that deserve dignity and need to, uh, you know, they need to be helped. They need to be organized. They themselves need to be re-empowered. And yeah. uh, the, you know, that's, that's very, that's thankless work. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, yeah, yeah. No, it was just something I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, since we had our, our initial conversation two years ago, I think it was like, I've had a lot of great experiences meeting people and uh, learning that there is like, there are more people who are at least if they don't identify with anarchism, they're interested in the ideas of anarchism. Uh, and, and they, they do that work to help people. So it's quite good. Yep. I think that a lot of people underestimate how many anarchists there are because anarchists are very um, split apart. They're very atomized, right? Yeah. And that's because of the way society functions. This is part one of the many reasons why I advocate that we need organizations. We need explicitly anarchist organizations is because it creates this sort of touchstone where people know how to get plugged in with other anarchists. It, it coordinates them together. It, it, it uh, fights back against that atomization. Whereas if you don't have an organization, people have no idea how to actually meet the other anarchists besides like getting like involved in some kind of, you know, scene like the punk scene or, or like attending protests. And even then you attend protests, good luck actually meeting the anarchists. If you don't, if there are no organizations in town, if the anarchists you have are completely anti-organizationalist, they're all in black block and they're definitely not going to be like, uh, hello, fellow anarchist, let us begin having <laughs> conversations about anarchism and planning actions together. You know, it's very insular and you yeah. have these very tiny sort of uh, 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 affinity groups that are, that don't be, they're not very good for coordinating new anarchists uh, with, yeah. uh, with older anarchists. I think that's the necessity of uh, anarchist organizations. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. Like I'm not an anti-organization person. I'm also not like a, uh, I'm not a very good OPSEC person. Like I'm the guy walking around with the big anarchist A on his shirt going, hi, where are all the anarchists? Yeah. So. I mean, that's fine. That's fine. I don't see any issue with that. You know, it used to be that we weren't as afraid of that, but you know, I understand that a lot of anarchists are very afraid of suppression and being tracked and all that kind of stuff. I get it. Yeah. 
um, and therefore the importance of black block. But also, if we are so underground that we remain atomized, then we're doing it wrong, clearly. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough to actually have or like to make a difference if you are, like you say, so atomized, so so uh, such small groups and, and unable to communicate with each other. Yep, absolutely. So uh, I was reading, yeah, well, I was reading like uh, some of uh, Zoe Baker's book today, uh, which is, I mean, that's only six months I've been reading that book. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, and I was uh, like uh, kind of focused on the idea that like uh, Bakunin and Malatesta and even Kropotkin, most of them weren't like, super pro guillotining the rich type guys. Like they were very, like very much more like we need to take their stuff. But if we're using violence all the time, like this isn't the best way to do things. Yeah. I mean, uh, first of all, that's a great book. If anybody wants an introduction to the actual history of anarchism as it is, and not as kind of like modern Reddit anarchists think it is, then that's a great book to read. It is it is an antidote to vulgar Reddit anarchism. Right. Uh, but yeah, no, that's all, that's his, accurate. Uh, the, the historically, what anarchists have always noted is that if if you create an apparatus for you know the the sort of mass executions of a class of people, then you're going to be very upset by what that apparatus ends up being used for. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's the, it's not the case, of course, that they're like, uh, against all executions of, you know, the pro the, or the, uh, of the, uh, bourgeois, right. They're not, a, it's like, they're, they just think that it's a bad idea to try to solve the problem through campaigns of massacres. You know, right. they, they look at the, they look at the, uh, uh, the terror in uh, the French Revolution as having been very uh, counterproductive, right? And they note that, okay, cool, yeah, I mean, you know, we're not too beat up that it executed a bunch of royals, but we are beat up that once they developed that apparatus for mass executions, it ended up also executing people who are just normal people who just didn't agree with what was taking place and people who were wrongfully accused and it led to witch hunting campaigns. And on the other side of the witch hunting campaigns was the guillotine and the guillotine therefore <laughs> ended up kind of representing the terror of the ruling class and not the terror of the people, uh, uh, uh which is, I guess maybe to say it is, it was the terror of the people they were afraid of. Right. It. Yeah. But it, it just ended up leading to a repressive state apparatus. So a lot of anarchists have been very skeptical that that is the solution. That being said, once again, it's not like anarchists are against the the uh, the the mass organization of violence in order to overthrow the previous state of things and to defeat people who array array themselves into to armies to stop us. Of course, that's obviously going to take place. It's just yeah. that that a uh, technique of trying to carry out a, a repressive. Uh, a state terror or a terror campaign uh, uh, against previous people who were previously in the ruling class doesn't seem to even work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. It's like, I see these kind of warnings a little bit like in uh, like Rosa Luxemburg's writings as well, where she was like talking about how uh, the, the tools that Lenin and, and the, the 1917 revolution, the Bolsheviks used actually from her perspective looked like they could be very much used to be a dictatorship against the proletariat rather than, uh, as tools, as a tool to lift them up. Which is of course, precisely what happened, you know, like it's, Obviously, the case that the you know that there was executions of the previous czarist class, and personally, I'm not going to cry over ever about that, right? And obviously, there was some repression of the previous bourgeois, and once again, I'm not going to cry a river about that. But the problem is, is that those same tools were mostly turned against the proletariat. They yeah. were used in order to essentially kidnap people, keep them in secret prisons, uh, ship them off to gulags, uh, execute them, subject them to false show or to show trials. Um, 
and uh, maybe even more uh, uh, egregiously, given their class politics, to crush things like independent trade unions, to, to, <laughs> right. to suppress, uh, uh, you know, organic voices of, of proletariat power, right? To to uh, disempower the Soviets and to and to empower the central government instead. You know, the, this kind of uh, vindication of precisely what those those anarchists were saying. You know, those those tools supposedly that were supposed to be used to suppress reaction ended up mostly being used to suppress the proletariat who was upset with the with the system they had put in place. Yeah, for sure. No, it's. Uh, I I think in the last couple of years I've learned a lot about the history that I didn't know before. I and a lot about the theory of anarchism that I didn't know before. And. Uh, I appreciate your your channel, and I appreciate the the time you've put in on 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 social media as well. Because <laughs> I don't know if I appreciate the time I put in on social media. I got to be honest; it's, that's fair. That's fair. it's yeah. No, that's fair. But I I, I appreciate that because it's uh, it's it's been an impetus for uh, a lot of learning that I've done over the last while, and it's uh, I think it's made me a better anarchist, honestly. <laughs> so. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. You know, that's, that's what I'm attempting to do, of course, is like inform our people, like spread the knowledge I've gained as much as conceivably possible. It's in large part, that's what I view the goal of anarch as being about, right? To mm -hmm. me, anarch is really a place for me to uh, sh shout through a megaphone all of the of the liberatory knowledge that I've I've gained in my research in my study. You know, trying to find ways as best as possible to convey these things to people in all sorts of different packages that will hopefully um, communicate with different kinds of people. So you know, I got the big long video essays, which are there for the people who are already bought in, of course. And then I've got the stuff that's a little more, uh, you know, kind of mid short form, like the uh, Anarcha Bridge stuff. And then I've now I've even started doing the very short form, just doing clips from my streams and stuff, you know. And yeah. uh, my goal with all of that is just to create a platform where these ideas can be spread. And uh, I'm glad to say it seems like it's been somewhat successful. You know, Twitter is also a megaphone. However, it is a megaphone into a fetid <laughs> swamp where everybody is um, uh, constantly trying to like kill one another and push everyone else's head back under the water of the swamp. Yeah. And uh, it's it's truly one of the worst places on the internet. Yet it is also one of the largest concentrations of radicals on the internet. Right. It's one of those uh, Twitter. I I. Cause when I go to work, I almost never do much on social media. So then I come back after a week of not being on Twitter and I open it up and I go, Oh my God, what's happening here? <laughs> There's always a dumpster fire. Always, 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 always. There's there, there, the dumpster fire never ends on Twitter. That's, that's, yeah. uh, that's its, its whole thing. And it's cyclic too. And you think to yourself, okay, we already put out this dumpster fire once we put it out <laughs> once or, you know, maybe surely, like, that's yeah. surely that's it, you know, and you give it like eight months. We're, not, we're back around to the same thing, just new participants yeah. this time, right? We just got different people all engaged in the same arguments and it doesn't get resolved. It just, they just <laughs> all end up in the same angry spiral. And uh, it, by the end of it, the two sides hate each other and they've mass blocked each other. It's yeah. uh, not very productive, unfortunately. No, that's right. Yeah, it's too bad. But like, especially considering like the connection between people like this, like over the internet, or over some form of social media could actually have good potential, but it obviously in the service of capital, it doesn't fucking, it's not a useful. I think that the useful part of Twitter is mostly for spectators, <laughs> 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 you know, for the people not engaged in the discourse, they get to sit back and just be like, Hmm, I'm going to think about both sides of this argument. You know, <laughs> they're going to browse the thread and be like, you know, such and such makes a good point, but blah, blah, blah makes a better point. You know, they get to just like sit back and discern <laughs> differences and arguments, you know, but those who are engaged in it, the people that are actually there in the trenches having the arguments, it's not beneficial for them. You know, I, no. I, I know from experience that all it does is, you know, eventually you're going to say something that a person you would consider an ally is upset about. It's, it's impossible. Right possible to avoid. 
no matter what, you're going to piss somebody off. And unfortunately, you're not only going to piss off your enemies, you're going to piss off people who agree with you. And I think it's just because Twitter is this place where uh, not only do people just uh, continually say what they think, right, without almost <laughs> any any sort of uh, 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 tactfulness, like zero tactfulness, they just say exactly what they think all the time. But worse yeah. than that, it, it also blows up and gets seen by thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. So you've also got the situation where you're going to get somebody who ha hates that opinion so much that they now hate you, that you are now, the, you yeah. are the devil, you are yeah. the devil. And there's just so much knee jerk reactivity. It truly is a cesspit, but it can be unfortunately at the same time, an excellent vector for education. So what a, what a terrible conundrum we are in. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Both hoping for its demise and also hoping that it gets better. Right. Yes. So I guess, what do you got coming up on the channel uh, in the future? Well, I am nearing completion of the script for my next massive video essay, which is nice. part four of the series I'm doing called A Modern Anarchism. I think last time I talked with you, I was like doing like part two of A Modern Anarchism. Yeah. That's how yeah. long the, the video <laughs> essays I create take, okay? They literally take almost a year from beginning to end through the whole production process to produce. But I am nearing completion of the draft for part four, which will be the final part of a modern anarchism. And it will be discussing the topic of organization. So nice. part one was essentially the anarchist analysis of the power structures and our current society more than anything, right? How does the current hierarchical uh, system function? And what is the anarchist perspective on that? Kind of introducing modern advancements as well, kind of like new thoughts, new, okay. new things that people have presented, introduced into that, that discussion, right? So it's kind of Ooh. modernizing anarchism as the title might suggest, right? <laughs> and then part two was me saying, okay, cool. What's the alternative structure? It's titled anarchy. Okay. And it's basically an analysis of what is anarchy? You know, what is it? What is the, the counter the, the contraposition to hierarchical power structures? Wh what are the uniting principles of a horizontal power structure? Why is that desirable? How would that even work kind of thing in a broad right. sense? What are those, those general principles? Part three was like, cool. We talked about how this system sucks. We talked about how a different system would be great or at least a lot better, right? How do we get from here to there? And so part, part three is titled revolution. And it's essentially laying out how do you do a revolution, right? Like what makes a revolution happen? And in, in I even lay out, I create this sort of flow chart that's like a roadmap of how somebody might carry out revolution uh, given different stages of advancement uh, and different conditions that you're in, uh, sort of laying out how does this all fit into the broader roadmap of how to carry out a revolution. Mm. And part four, once again, is organization. It's like, cool, okay, now we got that all out of the way. How do we actually build these organizations that are vehicles for that transformation? You know, what are the principles of these organizations? You know, what are their pitfalls? What are their strengths? Um, and that introduces even more systems theory, which is nice. essentially, you know, viability theory, uh, the concepts of Stafford Beer and Ashby and, um, you know, uh, uh, a complexity theory, which has been, which was begun in part two, it kind of now reaches this culmination here in part four. So that is what I am currently about to be entering production for, and who knows when that'll be released. I'm not, I'm not committing to a time <laughs> for that. No. Uh, <laughs> however, I every single week I actually release two videos. Uh, on Fridays, I release a sort of like. Either I do a live stream or I do a video that's between 20 to 30 minutes long, which is either a response to previous uh, topics or is an abridged discussion of some topic. And every Monday I release like a clip or some kind of short, something very short that's, you know, less than 10 minutes. Usually I'm just clipping my live streams and, you right. know, releasing those. So the channel, that's, I think that's a, that's a pretty good summary of what the channel is, where the channel's at. Oh, right on. Yeah. I, I uh. I found a tool on the internet that like, uh, that clips like your videos into like shorts and stuff. Mm. So I, I've been using that a lot. It, it's, a, I mean, everybody kind of hates AI right now, but I'm really loving this tool. Cause I, 
I have no time at all to do that work myself. <laughs> so, sure. Yeah, no, show it to me. I'll use it. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. yeah, share it. Yeah, it's pretty handy. Sounds good but, to me. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send you a link. Uh, uh, there's a paid version, but I think the free version is pretty useful too. All right. Well, sounds but, good to me. Yeah. So I guess uh, uh, we talked about the channel. We talked about a bunch of other stuff. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, obviously, I suppose you can find me at my YouTube channel, which is Anarch, A-N-A-R-K. If you type it into the search, you'll certainly find it. Um, I'm on Twitter as Anarch YouTube. And, uh, you know, the Twitter following is relatively large. Uh, those are the two main places you can find me. Obviously, if you like my work and you appreciate what I'm doing, uh, as I've described, you can go become a patron at my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash anarch. Uh, however, I suspect that you're only going to do so if you already know about the channel. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some, some person hearing about this for the first time may not go to, uh, I know, I know. It's a shame. They all should, yeah. all of you should become That's patrons. Right. Yeah. That's right. We need we need to support radical anarchist uh, content. Yeah, but it, you know it also helps me organize. You know, it gives me it gives me just a little more breathing room, so I have more time to devote to my, the organizations I'm part of as well. For sure. Yeah, I uh, I recently realized that I'm more of a propagandist than I am of like any kind of like. Uh, I'm not a debater. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a particularly good activist or organizer because I I keep. You know, I got other shit on the go, so I keep getting flaking on people. So I'm, but I do my show. And that's what that's what I can do. <laughs> so, well, I appreciate it and I appreciate uh, appreciate you having me on. For sure. Thanks so much for joining me. Absolutely, we'll talk soon, my friend. All right, that's all, folks. Thanks for watching and or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends and on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. I really appreciate it, and it helps me keep the internet and the power on. Thanks to my top patrons, Some Random Geek, Damien Marie at Hope, Justin Clark, Dan F. Smith, and Lisa Glass. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can send a one-time donation at, to me at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a like on YouTube or a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser would be great. If you want to find more from me, then make sure to check out the show notes for links to all my stuff or check out my website, skepticalleftist.com. That's where you can find all of my social media spaces and communities. Uh, or you can also email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening or watching. Make sure to leave a comment on the video or on my website. Join your local org, print off some posters or pamphlets, and spread the propaganda.